Nice. All right. Can you guys all see that? All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's get okay. started. Open H2O is the community for oceanic innovation. Open H2O is a very unique organization. It was all our first choices to work with because of that. And before we dive into the presentation, we'd like to all go around the table and explain our motivations for working with you guys once again. Hi, I'm uh, Yi. So the reason why I joined uh, Open H2O or previously Prote was because I found out that uh, Prote is the product Pro Prote um, was built upon the Arduino platform, and uh, previously in my work and as a hobby, I've worked uh, with the Arduino platform. And this immediately uh, clicked with me, and I could identify with uh, the project. And also, well, even though I may not uh, directly relate with um, oceanic research or conservation, um, on my side, I uh, I study, I read um, electrical engineering um, with a specialization in alternative energy, and um, I guess my purpose, my vision, my goal. Um, is runs parallel to Protease, and that is to make uh, the environment a better place for everyone. Hi, this is Shweta. Um, so uh, I come from a technical background myself, so um, I find the technology very interesting, uh, intriguing. Um, so I would uh, definitely like to be associated myself uh, with such high-end technology, and uh, I work for Applied Materials, which is also associated with clean tech. Um, so that's uh, um, uh, twice the reason why um, I uh, am interested in um, open edge tool. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Ken. I'm interested in open edge tool because the first thing is that I'm interested in the open source nature of the technology, which is project where people from all over the world can contribute to the project. And the second thing I'm interested is that it is an innovative technology that is designed to clean the environment and yeah. And this is Alan, just to quickly summarize. I'm passionate about technology, passionate about changing the world. I thought that OpenHTO is well positioned to do that. And so hopefully we can take you to, through this presentation and demonstrate to you what we've learned and why we've enjoyed working with you guys so far. What they, with that, OpenH2O's mission statement is compelling. We believe technology will change the world. We enable our community to produce solutions for oceanic development. We create innovative products such as Prote, an open source sailing drone designed for cleaning oil spills. OpenH2O is a global community of like-minded individuals who are passionate about using technology to improve our ocean, and as a team, here in the Bay Area, we share that same passion. So what is Open H2O's vision and what are our goals? If you guys remember, we drew this up a few weeks into it. Open H2O's vision is really to enable an online community for oceanic innovation. Our goals as a GEM team is to make that happen. We want to advise you on the marketing strategy to enable H Open H2O's vision. From that, our ultimate goal for Open H2O is to create and allow innovative products such as Prote to be developed and to be spun off. So we're working backwards. This was our approach. Conduct market research, turn it into analysis, come to conclusions, form recommendations that we can ultimately help with Open H2O's vision. So we approach our goals through the DDART framework. Each step of the way, we will break down for you what is the problem and opportunity, how will the user's experience change, what is our plan of action, why is our plan the best choice, and what are the risks and how do we manage them. Within these tools and methodologies, we use several practices and different steps along the way. Within diagnosis and experience, we conducted surveys, one-on-one -on -one interviews, talked about best practices. Within the, the decision analysis, we recommend branding, social media, website design, which we'll get to later on. And in the end, we do the reality test. After collecting our findings, we determine the contingency plans best suited for OpenH2O. 
So first we'll get into diagnosis. What is the opportunity? The tools we use here are the technology adoption lifecycle, also known as ALK, and we also identified the market. So where is OpenH2O on the talc? Through our discussions with Caesar and Etienne, surveys, research, and analysis, we concluded that OpenH2O is here on the talc, where the innovators stand, where the technologists are. And the reason we say this is because we use a framework of reference of other players within the same field. So as we talked about DIY drones and instructables, they are in the early adopter stage because they somewhat have a more basic community around them. Kickstarter, for example, has crossed the chasm. They have significant traction among the technologists and enthusiasts. They have scaled to reach the students, the attentions of research institutions, and even receive funding, $10 million from venture capitalists. With our help, we want to drive open H2O across the chasm. So the market opportunity is this. Our initial hypothesis was that there were five different buckets, technologists, enthusiasts, students, research institutions, and sponsors. Our goal is to teach you how to fish. <laughs> yeah, so the first person we analyze the technology. Uh, the characteristic is that they, are, they have expertise in marine engineering, communication, sensor and actuator, mechatronic and robotics. And Above all, they are passionate about the ocean, and there are several ways to engage them. The first way is to promote to people interested in open source technology, your bear website, or organize conference and call for people. And lastly, is to organize competition. Today we talk about the um, enthusiasts. Um, the enthusiasts are the people um, who are really um, interested and passionate about uh, technology um, and they're curious and eager to learn. Um, they're also students um, and their desire to uh, make the change in the community and the environment. Um, and they also uh, want recognition to their contributions uh, through projects. Um, they want um, the um, satisfaction and gratification of um, uh, developing new technology and collaborating with projects like this. So um, the places where we can find them are uh, conferences, uh, associations, um, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence groups, um, marine engineering groups, and of course, uh, open source communities. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where do we find them? We find them in universities. There are plenty of uh, groups and associations. For example, we have the Stanford Oceanic Group here. We have sailing organizations. Um, uh, in, uh, San Francisco is the best place uh, to find such organizations. Uh, we have the Bay. A lot of people interested in sailing and professionals in the technology industry and again Silicon Valley is the best place um, in the world to find such technologists uh, with the expertise um, uh, that we need um, to develop Prote and also groups on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter um, and IEEE and meaningful ways to engage them would be uh, through um, information and demos um, organize competitions um, promote open source technology uh, build a better website through which they can navigate um, and also organize more conferences. For students, we find out that they are, their main interest is to looking for academic knowledge, and they are eager to study about new technolo technologies. And lastly, they are highly interested in participating in competition. And there are several ways to engage them meaningfully. First way is to provide a platform where they can easily find out information about the innovative technology on open H2O. And we can also organize competition to attract them. All right, then um, the ne next up we have uh, the research institutions as a, a separate bucket. So they are mostly uh, academic in nature, um, although their bottom line is not uh, driven by profit. Uh, they are highly motivated by um, brand name their reputation. So how they gain reputations by uh, having their work published or having their faculty um, being invited to give talks. And uh, looking at the characteristics, um, meaningful ways we can engage them will be firstly to provide a visible platform for them to uh, do the, to promote their research or uh, provide ways for them to acquire resources to do their research. And thirdly is to provide a platform 
um, to facilitate collaboration across uh, many types of institutions. For example, uh, NP, uh, for example, NPOs or regulatory bodies. Hmm. So the last bucket is sponsor. In general, there are companies, businesses, or organizations which have similar missions. Then they believe in improving the environment by collaboration and innovation. And they are looking for win-win situation and crypto pro. And looking at their characteristics, there are several ways to engage them. The first way is to demonstrate the value of the technology. And the second way is to show the, le the levels of sponsorship and watch it and the details of each level. And we can also increase the sponsor visibility, press release, and teaching the community about the sponsor. Next, we'll move on to the experience, the user feedback. This is about the users finding out how they think, their barriers, incentives, and what their pain points are. Within here, we use these tools of market research, conducting surveys, conducting interviews, and conducting a one-on-one -on -one diagnosis. The market research method methodologies that we use for the web survey, a quick two-minute survey monkey questionnaire, and the goal is to collect feedback from the community. We also conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews, which were 30 to 60 minute long in-depth discussions with industry experts on the current state, post plan, and the long-term vision of open H2O. Within the web survey, we can break it down into what we discovered, or what was the conclusion. Total participants were 60, average age 33, Male to female ratio, 43%. Email address is provided, 50%, which we'll happily give to you guys as well. These are the ones, people that identified wishing to be emailed at a later point in time to keep updated and to see what else was going on with OpenHO. And also, 27% provided phone numbers for us to call. Web survey results. The participants that most dominated the surveys were enthusiasts, followed by students, followed by technologists, research institutions, and then sponsors. Here's a breakdown of the diverse set of participants that we've received. Highest level of education was a master's, followed by a bachelor's degree, then PhD students, undergrads, and then others. Within the geography, 56% were from the United States. 40% of those 56 within the United States were from the West Coast, and then you have the East Coast, and then you have the Midwest. The other 31% within the geography were from Europe, and then 6% from Asia, 6% from other. What some of the participants had to say in the open response area were quite interesting. Some of the best responses that we picked out of the users, participants were, I never heard of you before, but I loved what I read. <laughs> there is any way I can help, please let us know, or please let me know. I'm a marine engineer. The ocean is my life. How can I create a, a hub here in Lancaster? <laughs> Do your boats add to the plastic debris? <laughs> Keep the website uncluttered. Finally, good luck. We need this. <laughs> When asked, where do we find others like you, 35% of the participants responded. And the top three responses were groups, workshops, networks, universities, and, and social networks. As a result of the survey, a lot of our analysis and recommendation will focus on this part. When asked what gets you interested, you can see the top three is to discover innovative technology, they're passionate about the ocean, and they want to co-develop and co-design the technology. Respondents most want to see educational resources, other source project instructions, and uncovering new research. There were a couple of responses within the explain section of which people said, you have to tell people about what you do. Just doing without shouting it to the world will not get you new people interested in your mission. Cool videos, entertainment on what you do and why will help your mission. Another person said, I think every component would appeal to a different community, and the things you list are very exciting. So we see that people, when exposed to this idea, become naturally excited. 
It's just a matter of us being able to communicate what we have to say to the broader audience. When asked, what do you find interesting? Top three responses were oil spills, general oceanography, and coral reefs. What involvement interests you? You can see the top three are collaborate on a project, class or workshop, volunteer pro bono <laughs> skills. What was most surprising, however, when we asked this question was in the other section when someone actually filled out a very long paragraph. And I think you guys would want to hear this. It reads, Hi, I've been a follower of Open Sailing for a while since you were part of a Future Everything Award. Does that ring a bell to you guys? It's a festival I used to work with. I'm organizing a marine research pilot project between Liverpool, UK, and Norway in 2013, specifically marine hack spaces with artists, software developers, scientists, and DIY makers, culminating in a sea-bound journey from Oslo to Liverpool in 2014. If there was a way for the Prote project to take part at a hack space, we could provide you with travel, a research outline fee, and accommodation at Coastal Studios in the UK and Norway. <laughs> So this can contribute financially rather than Kickstarter. We are looking to keep an open source ethos to the project and do not want to own any of the work developed. It's more about supporting spaces for practice-based research. I'm also organizing an open hardware summit in August 2012 with Open Labs at John Moore's University in Liverpool and potentially we would welcome someone from the project to present there and could cover travel, accommodation, and some sort of presenter fee. This would be part of OGGCamp.org, a conference on open source culture. Clearly, this may be too close to August to set up, but I thought it might be worth mentioning. Please get in touch if you're interested. Ross at CheapJack.org.uk. A truly amazing project. I'm now obsessed with marine drones, and I've been <laughs> blogging about your work. Best, Ross. Yes, other invited people to do research pilot which is still at a fundraising stage, include owlproject.com backslash slow, Juha of http shippr.org, and Jana Winder, Winderen, W I N D E R E N. Yeah, so this response is in the presentation notes. So if you guys open it, it's on slide 25, and it's provided below. Next to one-on-one -on -one interviews, we were able to get in touch with research institutes, sponsors, and enthusiasts. From our sponsors, we had our very own Catherine Ford represent <laughs> Nokia. She provided some very insightful knowledge of which we were able to use effectively. First, the research institute interview. Feedback open A2 on Prote. The key takeaway here was that there is no real community like this that exists. Prote and open H2O, it's a bit unclear, but the word needs to get out. It needs a clearer message people can identify with. When I asked them, would they use Prote, they said, no, we don't do the oil spills. But if we could sample more than just the surface and if we can create other technology on top of it, maybe remote sensing, then yes, I would. I then asked him how to form a partnership with him. He responded, Ocean Oceanographic societies would be interested in something like this. Wouldn't really form a partnership with the institution because they are just a collection of scientists. Easier and better to work with the individual. When talking to the sponsor, the key takeaway here was that Open H2O and the sponsor will have to be aligned with the same goals. The benefits of the sponsor would have to show them that by sponsoring Open H2O, there would be increased visibility, listen and press releases, access to audience and user base, and pretty much that win-win definition that we talked about earlier. Action for Open H2O to receive sponsorship will be to create a program for sponsors, actively seek them out, and present different levels of sponsorship. So very similar to the Kickstarter method. Here's a list of examples that would be great sponsorship candidates for Open H2O. And their feedback on Prote and Open H2O was to separate the two and communicate a clear win-win situation. Well, I have a question. So, you did the 
they choose to let you go over to so many other platforms or whatever platforms that they have out there to sponsor. Right? I mean, from the company perspective, I have X dollars that I'm putting into my budget every year that I need to choose that are maybe big sponsorship because what they're providing me is sort of for the community and all that stuff, but that's also something that's not part of Did you hear my question? No. So my question, my question basically was that you know when when um, you talk about sponsorship and you say the benefits to sponsors is the increased visibility and and you know that sort of thing. Uh, my question is why should the sponsor? I mean, you're getting increased visibility, you know, legitimate press releases and access to uh, audiences and the user base. I mean, this is something that the sponsor can get through funding other projects as well. So yeah. my question was what. Is it particularly about rotate that would actually interest sponsors? The high level answer to that would be because they believe in the same thing. So the sponsor would believe similar similarly to OpenStro, the technology will change the world. And more specific answer is that they believe in oceanic development. They believe in technology that will venture into a new environment, a new industry. And they see that OpenHDO's community is strong, is that it's able to bring innovative technology, it's able to design things that other communities don't, and the access to OpenHDO as a community is way more valuable than some of the other players we've had. So through these surveys, interviews, and data collection, we came to a wonderful moment, <laughs> what we call the aha moment. <laughs> which I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> First, the one-on-one -on -one diagnosis is what we discovered the pain points of why we are not adopting OpenH2O, primarily because of communication problems, because simply they didn't know of it, OpenH2O. Next is the motivational factors. They don't understand really what's in it for me. And lastly is the skills gap of I don't know how. I don't know how to contribute. I don't know where to contribute. I don't know why to contribute. I, and we believe that we can solve for all these things. Next, we figure out what this all means. And here's where you want to pay extra close attention. We have used these tools to form our recommendation, creating a new ecosystem, a bucket analysis, a positioning statement, and mapping out of the whole product. Here's where it gets really, really interesting. Here's the aha moment. The new ecosystem. Currently, there's a problem. There's a huge problem. Oceanic research institutions buy their equipment from disparate providers. They make purchases by word of mouth and have no efficient way of comparing prices, equipment functionality, or communicate what other tools they need. This is one major reason why oceanic development is so slow. So clearly, there's a significant gap in the market and it shouldn't be this way. There should be something to fill this market need. So what's the solution? The solution is to create an Amazon.com like marketplace for the buyers and sellers of oceanic equipment. Buyers would go, buyers would be the research institutions and sellers would be the oceanic equipment providers. Then it becomes open H2O. You bring enthusiasts, your students and your technologists to the community who contribute and innovate to co-designing, licensing, and sharing data. And the byproduct of all your success will be the sponsors. So in this new ecosystem, we classified and consolidated enthusiasts as students and technologists. And we'll get to that later of why we decided to do so. Right. Uh, moving on, this matrix that you see now highlights the relationship between the three buckets that we just uh, uh, identified. So you notice that as we go down the list, uh, when one group provides, the others benefit. So it is this kind of, kind of a quid pro quo system that we need to build uh, where you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. So firstly, <laughs> under technologies, um, equipment providers supply the instrumentations and the research apparatus to the other two groups, and in return, they receive revenue to go their business. So the field of uh, information is um, where the most intricate exchanges happen. OK, 
the equipment providers, um, being subject matter experts, can and do have the knowledge to pass on to the research institutions to, to improve their research methodologies. So research institutions and enthusiasts who have the, who use the equipment uh, that this equipment provider sell can give feedback on which features to retain, to improve, or to discard. Research institu uh, institutions and enthusiasts also form a nice synergy uh, in this area. So enthusiasts craving for uh, new interesting findings or projects to work on can depend on the research institutions to provide them. And uh, re research institutes who need independent data to support their hypothesis or claims can recruit, uh, recruit enthusiasts to provide a second pair of eyes. A uh, reputation is um, key for equipment providers uh, whose niche uh, de uh, business depend on good referrals, referrals and this is where uh, research institutions and enthusiasts they come to play. So imagine if your autonomous submarine becomes endorsed by the Stanford Oceanic Research Group or a product you sell goes viral on YouTube because an enthusiastic user found a really cool way to use it and uploaded it. So the amount of visibility your company can gain will be Taking. And that's why uh, we think uh, reputation plays a very big part in this ecosystem. And last but not the least is the potential talent pool that spans across all three of our markets. So research institutes, equipment providers and enthusiasts, although they may not share the same uh, common background, but they are all subject matter, matter experts in, in this uh, area of oceanic uh, research. So the transfer of talent between these buckets can also form um, reinforce this, this ecosystem. So with the development of the new ecosystem, we come up with a positioning statement for Open H2L. Open H2L for research institutions, oceanic equipment providers and enthusiasts who believe in technology to improve the ocean, Open H2O is an online collaborative community that brings together like-minded people with diverse skills, set and backgrounds. Unlike the currently fragmented system, our product takes an integrated approach at co-developing, licensing, and sharing in an inclusive environment. Right. So, how do we get started on this is that we first have to build the community and then secondly, once the, we've developed the minimum viable product, and that's the Open H2O website, we can then grow the community by adding um, valuable content that synergizes this, uh, this ecosystem. And once we have reached critical mass, is then we can, uh, is where we can spin off technology and make uh, Open H2O visible to the whole world. So in the short term, we need to first build the minimum viable feature set. <coughs> so just like every structure needs the solid foundation, the minimum viable product is the core set of features that we think should be on Open H2O when it launches, such that visitors to the site are attracted to it and remain attracted to it. So how we decided on this set of features is done through our market research, which uh, includes two, me uh, two methods, surveys and best practices. So in our survey, we asked our surveys what features they wanted most and in what areas they felt most comfortable contributing to. So in addition, we also took a look at some of the best practices that other successful online communities exhibit and incorporate them if we felt that they could make a significant impact to open h 2 So in our analysis section uh, later on, we'll explore a few of these factors in detail. But as I mentioned earlier, building the minimum features isn't enough. So on top of that, we need to create content and using the features that we have, reach out to our buckets and get them involved. Okay, being a community portal, the content that we put up should probably probably include a social element to it. So the reason for this is because we want to encourage a two-way dialogue 
or even a many-way discussion instead of a one-way monologue where the slide admin will just uh, distribute information to the users uh, without any uh, reciprocation. Mm. So ev especially um, evident in the social media front, okay, this technique of sharing has a good chance of achieving virality. So um, later on, we'll discuss some of the social media uh, media strategies that you want to employ. Okay. Using the content um, to attract user participation has this um, vicious, okay, it's not a vicious cycle, it's more like a healthy cycle, where the content that we use to attract user participation can let um, can be used to leverage on the community to grow in even more even more user generated content. So the last stage um, only kicks in when we have numbers to show. So this is when it will be easier, or it's not exclusive to this stage, but it will be easier for us to seek a VC funding or sponsorships when you can uh, show that we actually deliver the results. So it's also when we have the repu rep uh, reputation and resources to incubate other startups which have goals aligned with ours. And that by itself will open up even more doors for OpenH Duo to expand our um, breadth of operations. So but this stage is still a, uh, this quite a distance away. So what we've highlighted here maybe only uh, represents a slice of what is possible. At this stage, we would have um, gone over and beyond uh, what we need to uh, do as the go-to-market strategy and may require us to employ a different set of, uh, set of skills. So now moving on to analysis. So um, for the ecosystem analysis, uh, we have identified uh, three different buckets, uh, the research institutions, um, the enthusiasts, and the oceanic equipment providers. Um, so the uh, research institutions uh, are the ones uh, uh, with the profile, uh, such as uh, NPOs, uh, regulatory bodies, um, and uh, uh, who build uh, brand names as top priority and uh, recognition by get, having their work published and getting uh, invited to give talks. Um, the likely groups and associations uh, uh, for these research institutions are the Oceanic uh, Society, um, American Geophysical Union, American Society of Climology, and, and uh, National Science Foundation. And uh, where we can find them, university directories, um, graduate students, and uh, uh, institution websites. And the most meaningful ways to engage them are by providing a visible platform um, to promote research and provide um, resources to do research uh, for these um, the people from research institutions and uh, provide a platform to facilitate uh, collaboration across institutions. And uh, enthusiasts, as we mentioned before, are the ones who are curious to um, uh, learn and uh, collaborate and develop new technology, uh, basically the geeks and the nerds um, and uh, who are interested in uh, sailing and ocean. Um, and uh, uh, who are interested in conserving the ocean. Um, so we, where we can find them, again, as we mentioned before, uh, through um, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence groups, open source communities, um, sailing associations, um, and other engineering groups. Uh, and uh, we can find them at universities, sailing organizations, um, the technology industry, um, online, um, uh, through LinkedIn and Twitter, and also um, conferences, um, uh, high-level conferences, such as um, IEEE. And how we can engage them is again through um, organizing uh, competitions, conferences, building uh, websites uh, for them to uh, communicate with us uh, and engage with us, and um, through information demos um, and uh, also providing incentives. Oceanic equipment providers, um, uh, these are the people who uh, design, produce, and manufacture oceanic equipment. And uh, they also serve as independent researchers uh, uh, through research institutions and they collaborate uh, with research institutions. And uh, their primary application is to monitor, uh, measure, and collect data for oceanic research. And uh, where you can find them um, through oceanic uh, uh, instruments companies, um, 
through bio uh, spherical instruments these are some of the companies that we've listed here uh, wet labs oregon uh, hobie labs washington and um, likely groups and associations will be consortium for ocean leadership um, uh, environmental services um, and how we engage them will be through um, uh, uh, providing a platform to display the store and equipment for sale, uh, basically promoting their products, um, giving uh, visibility into customer demand um, and how to improve sales, um, and showing them uh, what tools and functions the buyers want and need. So, um, so we're just giving personas uh, for the buckets that we identified earlier. Um, th this is the persona that we've given for oceanic research equipment providers uh, who are uh, profit-centered and uh, they are highly specialized in Asian markets and um, the subject matter experts. They, uh, they uh, know what goes on in the uh, ocean uh, research and uh, they have high-level data that uh, the public cannot access. And uh, meaningful ways to engage them would be to acquire leads um, uh, to, for these uh, ocean equipment providers and assist in uh, building long-term relationships. Through our surveys and analysis, we recommend that there be a more clear brand associated with open A2O. There needs to be a clear message of separation between open A2O and Prote. What we mean by the product is Prote and the community is open A2O. So not Prote, rather than open H2O. And one of the main reasons behind this is it's because surveys and interviews of people were confused about what this community was and what the message is. By setting up their branding, we can effectively communicate our mission statement and our vision to the rest of the world. So um, we also try to um, uh, explore the social media strategy. Um, so why we need social media uh, for open H2O? Um, so as Alan mentioned before, we're trying to build an online community for um, open H2O, and uh, what better uh, way uh, than to use social media networks? Um, so it extends the brand and its relationship with the customers. It provides instant feedback. It's a faster way of communicating. It encourages uh, two-way communication through feedback, immediate feedback from uh, our customers. Um, and it also leads to uh, other valuable sources of traffic for the website. Um, in addition, um, uh, as we uh, saw from the survey, 29% of the survey participants uh, mentioned that social networks are a huge medium to find uh, people to build the community. So. Um, so with the okay, uh, social media for open edge tool. So um, the main uh, goal for open edge tool um, is to build a community. And um, as um, um, Alan mentioned from one of his interviews uh, with the head of the Oceani Group, um, the uh, main uh, thing that he stressed upon was to get the word out for Prote and open edge tool uh, for people uh, to join the community. So we need to create awareness. Uh, about open H2O and its goal uh, uh, to the people, the public, and uh, sponsors, enthusiasts, and technologists, um, which we can do through uh, Twitter. And we can increase visibility um, uh, through uh, Facebook, which has a huge um, uh, user base, uh, the general public. And to find industry key people, uh, we use LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, where we can find individuals and not just research institutions. Um, so as uh, Alan mentioned from one of his interviews, we need to reach out to the individuals. And this is uh, these two websites uh, give us um, uh, the platform to find uh, individuals. And how, how you build a community by engaging people, um, by letting them um, uh, feel um, uh, more involved in the community, uh, by uh, providing feedback. Um, and uh, posting content, um, and that's how we build a community. So uh, we, we created a Twitter profile on uh, May 10th, uh, uh, approximately a month ago. And so far, we have about 44 followers uh, till date. Um, and some of the most important followers that we've identified are uh, David Guggenheim, who is the head of Ocean Doctor, uh, doc org, um, uh, which uh, uh, provides funding for projects uh, like open H2O, uh, there are a lot of projects on the website. Yeah, uh, a lot of projects on the website. Um, if you can go up um, and uh, look at those, uh, they're very similar to uh, what Prote is all about. And uh, he's also a scientist, um, so he can be a potential uh, sponsor uh, for uh, open H2O. 
um, and since he has a huge fo fan following, uh, we can also get that community to uh, join the one H2O. So, um, and then there are several um, other ocean groups such as New Ocean Blue, uh, which educates about oceans, uh, garbage patches, and uses grassroots techniques to eliminate uh, plastic pollution and promote the use of reusable materials, which is very relevant to what uh, Open H2O is all about. And the environment is a company which develops reusable dry clean bags. And LMR, um, uh, which falls into the category of technologists, uh, we are trying to find technologists, um, especially robotics, um, to uh, develop protein. And uh, this is the world's biggest robot building community. So it's a huge thing uh, for them to follow us. And CDUB, again, it's a marine engineering company uh, which serves yards and boats. And Code My Designs is a Drupal developer um, uh, which designs uh, websites uh, uh, for communities like us. So uh, th these will be very important partners for us. And Mike Clarkson uh, is uh, from NASA. He tweets about technology, science, and the environment, which gives us huge visibility for uh, Open H2O. And History Bay Marine and uh, Clean Ocean Action are two other um, ocean groups uh, which um, are interested in the ocean. And Drupal Bangalore again uh, it helps uh, companies build websites with Drupal, and which is what we're looking for currently. So, so uh, they are these are the ideal partners for us. And uh, so we've identified uh, some sponsors, um, uh, partners, and um, potential enthusiasts uh, through uh, David and uh, uh, Mike Larson and uh, Ken Kosky will be the potential partners. Um, CDA and Green Tomato and Ocean Blue will be the potential partners, and uh, Drupal and uh, LMR and Koma Designs will be the potential technologists with, uh, with which we can collaborate for Open H2O. And this is a distribution of followers currently on Twitter who are following Open H2O. We have uh, plenty of media marketers, uh, researchers, ocean groups, um, startups, nonprofits, and entrepreneurs, the ideal audience um, for. Um, Open H2O. And uh, these are the, the uh, potential audience that we've identified um, well, who we can contact um, and uh, uh, draw them to the community. There are about 33 ocean groups and uh, plenty of media marketing groups, technology groups, open source communities with more than 20,000 people associated with them. Um, so Twitter is the ideal place to um, uh, get these people to join the community and create awareness from them. Um, so we did some experiments um, on how to get more people to follow us on Twitter and uh, to build a community. And we uh, um, studied uh, DIY drones, uh, which is a similar community um, uh, to Open H2O. Um, on their Twitter profile, uh, what they do is they tweet at least uh, two, two, two tweets a day. That is, uh, on an average, 14 tweets per week. Um, <coughs> and they post mostly links related to the industry and products from DIY drones. Um, so the idea is to model open edge to uh, after DIY drones. Um, so uh, we conducted several experiments uh, on Twitter, and uh, here's the experimental results and eventually the strategy to follow. Um, we, so we need to use uh, hashtags with keywords um, as many as possible. For example, when I put in hashtag with Drupal, immediately uh, code my designs and Drupal Bangalore started following this, which is a um, really good result. So we need to tweet with hashtags. And uh, we need to find uh, people similar uh, to open h to and follow them. And eventually, they will definitely follow us. Um, uh, people relevant to open h will be um, nonprofits, open source communities, and ocean groups. Uh, we have to provide access to all the team members of Open H2O to tweet as often as possible. And we implemented a Twitter button on the website. Um, so whenever somebody visits the website, they can follow us on Twitter. And we need to call out for people um, on different groups, individually contact them uh, to join the um, community. And post survey on different groups. We posted uh, the survey and we got some good response. So um, that's uh, the strategy for Twitter. And for Facebook, um, we know that there are uh, 750 million users. Um, so it gives us a huge audience um, and visibility for open h So uh, the uh, Facebook profile was already created by uh, the last group uh, in December. Uh, and it has 37 people associated. So 
uh, what we have to do is uh, we have to contact ocean groups on uh, Facebook and share the Prote page. So uh, a lot of people get to know about what Prote is all about. Uh, there are more than 3,000 people currently uh, with ocean conservancy groups associated. So we need to share surveys with them, uh, which has already been done, and we got some impressive response. Um, and invite more people from these groups to join the Open H2O community as soon as the um, website comes up and implement the Facebook like button, uh, which will definitely um, increase um, the search index on Google sites. Um, so LinkedIn uh, is a very good platform to find individuals and not just um, associations and institutions. Uh, to reach out to individuals, this is a, a good website. Uh, it has a lot of technologists mainly. Um, and we created a profile for uh, Open H2O on LinkedIn, and uh, we invited a lot of people. And currently, it has about 18 members. And this is the uh, demographics of the group, um, mainly from engineering um, and research. Um, and geographical location-wise, they're mostly from the Bay Area, San Francisco, which is where Pro Open H2O is trying to build its uh, base. So it is ideal um, uh, for us to find people um, and collaborate with. And these are some of the uh, potential technical collaborators uh, we can find on LinkedIn. There are uh, more than 20,000 people um, associated with uh, automation, uh, mechatronics, robotics, and naval architects, and sensors and actuators. Um, these are the kind of people Open H2 is currently looking for to develop Prote. Um, hence, it, this is a good platform to find people. So um, some of the experiments that we did on LinkedIn um, and the strategy um, that we eventually will uh, uh, take um, is to provide access to all the team members to post content. Uh, we have to post uh, discussions and post links uh, and um, post jobs uh, on the group and company profiles, post videos, um, as some, uh, someone mentioned uh, from the interview, it's the uh, ideal way to draw people and uh, post surveys, which has already been done, and uh, post more surveys and contact more groups um, to uh, get good feedback for the website, and uh, create groups for collaborators, and LinkedIn provides opportunities to create project spaces um, um, and uh, workspaces uh, with GitHub and uh, other technologies, and invite people to join, join the group. Uh, it creates a lot of awareness. Um, so. About 40% of the people we invited joined the group, and most of them didn't know what Open H2O was all about. So the ideal way to do is um, uh, invite people to join the groups. And joint technology professionals group, there are plenty of uh, uh, professional groups where we can find potential collaborators. So we find um, and post jobs on these um, groups and post promotions, post job openings, as I mentioned earlier. and. Uh, uh, post keywords, people can find open H2O, and it has high search engine indexing. Um, so we need to implement the LinkedIn button on the website as well. So it has a higher page rank on Google. Uh, but some of the uh, pros and cons of these social media websites individually. Facebook has a huge user base, about 750 million users, and increases visibility. But then uh, the base is mostly younger, and we don't find industry key people on Facebook, um, not active much. Um, and doesn't po uh, provide too much space to post content, um, and it, it has limited interaction between the users. And for Twitter, um, the advantages you know, are to find industry key people. It's a faster way to connect. Um, it provides a target audience, and people can find us, you know, like inbound marketing. But uh, it also uh, provides limited uh, space to post content. And LinkedIn, again, it's um, great to find uh, technologists uh, um, individually. Um, and it has a huge base of technical collaborators um, and can filter out with geographical location. And it has high search engine indexing and higher interaction between users. Uh, but the uh, disadvantages are that we have to reach out to people rather than people reaching us. And again, there is limited space to post content. Um, so as we saw from the networking websites, uh, we see that um, there is very limited space to post content on these websites. Uh, it's a great way to connect with people, but then uh, when we need to uh, share information, um, we need to use blogs. It enhances visibility, increases traffic for the community website, and uh, promotes products, generates leads, and of course establishes industry expertise. So we created uh, a blog for uh, Open H2O, um, and we are still working on it, and uh, we try to um, uh, uh, allow search engine indexing and provide space uh, that the social networks do not provide. So um, 
and we also saw from the survey that about 25% of the participants would like to get more information about open H2O from blogs. Um, so we studied again a DIY drones um, blog page on its website um, and we see um, that uh, they post about 35 uh, posts per week on an average and um, uh, the members um, can post uh, their provided login information and there is two-way communication so people can comment on the blog posts. So this is the uh, path that we should also take and although we have a blog currently for uh, Protec, uh, it needs to be improved and these are some of the suggestions and recommendations uh, to improve the blog on Protec. Integrate the web page with the website and make navigation easier. Provide login information to access the blog page to all the members of the community. Allow members to post about industry-related events. Um, um, need to have more comments uh, from people and write articles and provide links um, related to the industry and also other products from uh, OpenH2O and have industry key people uh, post guest blogs and post interviews conducted with industry key people. All right, so um, moving on to website design, the social media strategy provides the meat of the content, of the content but uh, the website uh, is basically the backbone in which all, all this, the meat of the content lies on. So um, the two, the two uh, research methodologies that we used uh, to, de uh, to determine what goes in our, on, our, on our, web, our website are firstly the survey results and secondly, we also crawled the web um, to look at other communities to find the best practices that we should import into OpenH2O. So from our survey results, the most wanted features on OpenH2O are uh, the educational resources. People want to learn more about the oceans and the technology to improve the ocean. Secondly, uh, open source pro uh, project instructionals, besides learning about them, uh, that there's a huge percentage of people who also want to get their hands dirty and to uh, build their own uh, robots. And uh, lastly, uncovering new research. This ties in nicely to um, uh, learning about um, educational resources. So um, enthusiasts and uh, uh, ocean, oceanic equipment providers, they want to learn what the research institutions have, have learned about, have discovered, and uh, incorporate this into their own uh, projects, hobbies, or products. So with that in mind, uh, what we want to do is to firstly organize the content. So it's not that the current Prote uh, website lacks content. Um, in fact, the current Prote uh, website has a lot of content, just that we need to organize it uh, in, in a better way. Why? Because uh, the web page is no longer just a collection of information. If we want to attract users, then we must be able to relate to them. And uh, not just that, we must be able to tell our story in the most uh, frictionless way possible. So uh, we need to know what they are looking for uh, when they come aboard. And this is where our survey results come in. Uh, besides, um, sorry. Um, besides um, organizing the content, we also talk about this concept called uh, project centricity. Because on OpenH2O, the main focus uh, would be the, the projects that, that reside uh, on our web page. So we need to make this uh, all these projects central to our website. And lastly, we also look at forums. Um, although this is uh, quite an old method of bringing about discussions, it, we found that it is still very prevalent and there's a reason for it. Right, so um, organizing the content. So this is what the main page of our website would prob uh, probably look like. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen this before. So what goes here? News, uh, research headlines, and product showcase. So these are the type of educational resources that we want to put right up front uh, where the people want them. The key takeaway here is that not all content are uh, created equal. So um, on the back end, we need to develop the capability to sense what people seem to like and put these articles in front. So what uh, one of the ways we can do it is by tracking the number of likes uh, or subscribe button um, via the social media strategies that we've ju just discussed.
now um, moving on to from uh, organizing the content, we move on to uh, talking about project centricity. So a college portal and uh, talk, let's uh, look at the college portal versus the individual student space. So on every um, college portal, for, for example, the Stanford coursework, uh, we can see that um, every uh, individual student will have a standardized uh, feature set on coursework. And how this relates to OpenH2 is that on OpenH2, every project space will have have to have the same feature set um, across the board to make things uh, the same across all projects. So here um, I'll introduce the project space. So again, all projects same, uh, share the same feature set. Firstly, the About Us page, the Showcase page, and the workspace page. So what you see here is the About Us page. The About Us page uh, lets visitors to this website learn about uh, what the, what this project is about. For example, um, on this page, you um, get to see a brief overview of the Prote project, and you get to see the key people um, um, involved in this project. And tying to our social media strategy, we also want uh, visitors to this, to this website be able to easily connect to the project team members. And that's why you see um, Twitter or Facebook connect um, buttons next to the profile pictures. The next set of feature is the workspace. So this is a set of uh, integrated collaborative tools um, that, that all projects have access to. And uh, we found that this, this method of um, collaborating uh, really is very effective on, on two levels. One is that it allows one to many dissemination, and that uh, a project admin, an uh, administrator, can uh, create things like the to do list. For example, we see Prote sponsor meeting at 9.30, created by Alan. So this is like an example of a one-to-many dissemination. And on top of that, it also allows many-to-many -many sharing. So for example, um, you see a discussion agenda for sponsor meeting posted by um, Alan again. And this um, ties in, this is kind of like a forum thread that allows many users to uh, participate on. Of course, this is just a, a sample, uh, a sample example of uh, the features that we want to include as um, the OpenH2 uh, portal is developed further. We may find that uh, we want to add features or take away features that uh, users want or do not want. And lastly, is the showcase page, uh, sh showcase page, which is basically the window uh, that allows um, visitors to this website to see what the projects have been working on. So unlike the About Us page, which, which just gives a brief overview, the Showcase page um, talks more in depth about uh, what the milestones that are, or project features that uh, the, the the current project has, I mean, the project has uh, accomplished. So for example, here you see that um, Prote, the latest update is that um, Caesar was featured on the TEDx or, or Orlando uh, conference. So this gives uh, visitors to uh, this gives visitors a um, sense of what's happening, uh, the latest uh, happenings on the projects. So one one way to tie this back to the main page of the website is that uh, people can like um, can like or tweet about this uh, these activities. And the more likes you get, then the higher uh, ranking you get, um, the higher the rank you get, and the more likely that your um, this article will be featured on the main page. And the last uh, feature that we want to talk about is uh, forums. So although this is uh, quite an old way of uh, disseminating information, uh, we found that it's still prevalent uh, across many, many uh, 
communities. For example, uh, Hardware Zone in Singapore, or Fritzing, um, another online collaborative web page. And the reason for this is that it is versatile. So discussions of on of many sorts can happen. Uh, can we can range from idle chit chat. You can even have an integrated market uh, place inside for um, inside our forums. And second um, is the factor of uh, uh, nostalgia, because forums are very classic, and um, many forum software follow a similar format and have the same uh, feature set. And that's why people can identify very easily with forums. And that's why we uh, we think that forums should be a feature on OpenH2O. Next on, uh, we'll move on to the analysis on partnerships. Yes, yeah, so moving on to partnership, we decided that we can split the potential part partners in different groups, which are the universities with ocean program or companies interested in the ocean, the, the government, the, the similar open source com communities or the online ocean sites. And you can see examples of each group in the table on the right side. Yeah. So when we look at the partner, we look at two important assets that pa partners can give us, which are knowledge and money. So we decide to divide the pa partners into four categor categories, which which are limited partners, learning pass, learning partners, earning partners, and strateg strategic partners. In limited partners. There are non-profit organizations and online ocean sites. Moving up to uh, limited partners can provide us with limited amount of knowledge as well as limited amount of money. Uh, moving up, we have earning partner, uh, which include companies interested in the ocean technology as well as sponsor. Earning partners can give us a strong financial support. However, they can give us limited knowledge. And moving on to the knowledge side, we have learning partners. In this category, open there are open source communities as well as universities. They can provide us with invaluable knowledge, like how to build uh, an effective community as well as knowledge about the technology technologies on open H2O community. And the last category is strategic partner and the government falls into this group. They can provide both strong financial support as well as invaluable knowledge in technology. Um, our term is to focus on building a community. Uh, our recommendation is to focus on learning partner because open source commu communities can provide us with invaluable uh, information on how to build and grow a, a community. Why university can provide us with their uh, final in re research in technology as well as uh, exposure to the large user base of students. And we analyze the gift cards for partner, the first group. The first group we uh, analyze is the open source community. <coughs> so, if partners partner thing with open source community, the partner can give us a huge base, a uh, huge base of customer. Why they can get the traffic which go to open H2 community. And about technology, uh. Both open source uh, communities and open edge can provide each other with uh, innovative techno technology on each other's websites. And open source communities can provide open edge with invaluable knowledge about how to build a community, which is very important to open edge And on the other hand, open edge can provide with 
open source community about the new technolo technology resources uh, which is de developed on open HTO. And about reputation, open HTO can credit open source communities at cutting edge projects. Why uh, open source communities can feature open HTO projects as innovative and technology on ocean. And for core competencies, uh, open HTO can increase traffic to uh, open source com communities can increase traffic to open HTO. While open HTO can provide official support for the technology developed on open HTO platform. And moving on to partner GiveGet analysis with universities. The most important assets that universities can give us is a huge base of customer, which is their student. And giving back, we can give them innovative practical pro projects that they can use for their for teaching purposes. And about technol technology, we can get invaluable knowledge from their research on the ocean program inside the technology. Why we can give them back the instructor instruction and demo session exclusively for their students. And also about resources, we can get invaluable contribution contribution from students and professors from top university in the world. Why we give them with real and practical innovative project which they can use for their ocean program. For reputation, university can give us endorsement by can give them by innovative programs with practical and innovative project to uh, use in their uh, ocean program. And lastly, for core competencies, universities can explore open edge to a, a large student base by we can provide them by with training materials and supports. Right. Sorry. So um for the for the previous parts we have provided you a high level um strategy and the motivations behind these strategies. So right now, um we're going to present to you the timeline for the action plan. So this slide uh, shows a list of actionable items that OpenH2 can can uh, can do to start uh, building this community. So firstly, um, this is this uh, follows a strong correlation to the vision that we have. That is uh, that is the short term, the mid term, and the long term uh, goals. Um, in this part, we've divided it divided into phase one, phase two, and phase three. The reason, the reasons for this is because um, the next phase wouldn't be able to happen without the previous phase um, being completed. And that's why we uh, found that it's important to clearly segregate, segregate it this way. So phase one, we must first build up the minimum viable feature set that, that we've discussed. And all those, uh, we would like to depend heavily on the community to build up the content we first have to prepare a set of launch articles so that can be used to publish our projects to feature. So this allows um, for a starting point for the uh, community to latch on and to build upon. Without this, then uh, the OpenH2 website would be just would just be an empty website. So of course, um, in addition to building a website, you also need to recruit a core team of people to manage the site and um, this can be anything from uh, an administrative point of view to uh, to be or as a columnist uh, on the website. So once that is done, then the website goes live, and we can move on to phase two. And this is when we start to get the community involved in the project, so we can organize events or start uh, promoting open H two O via our partners and our channels. And hopefully this will build build up, and over time our community will grow in numbers to a point where the critical mass is reached. At at this point, then we move on to phase three, and this is when we can really start uh, bragging, and uh, because we have the numbers, so we can start uh, showcasing uh, OpenH2O to the world. For example, go on TEDx like uh, 
what we've discussed before. Um, of course, we can also do this um, before this phase, but I think that, uh, we think that uh, at this point, this is where the will be the most effective because um, the momentum we already have achieved the momentum. So once uh, once we feature ourselves at this point, then um, the traction that we gain will be the fastest. And of course, lastly, is to approach our corporate sponsors and our VCs with the numbers. Uh, um, once we have the numbers, we I think we become, become irresistible, and so that's uh, the action plan for open H2. But of course, that's um, the ideal scenario. We are we could We, we just won, lost one of the two computers. Hello? <laughs> yes! Yay! <laughs> Welcome back, Apollo. <laughs> okay, we were in just in the beginning of the reality test. Oh, my God. Okay. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll uh, move on to the reality test. Um, the reasons for this is because um, what we've under the, the actionable items that we've just discussed, uh, this represents the, the ideal scenario. You also have to prepare for when things don't quite. Uh, uh, it's what we expect it to be. So, firstly, in the case that OpenH2O's website does not gain tra uh, enough traction, then first we have to find out which features uh, that are attractive that gain the most users and which are off-putting um, that users do not really want to use and now we, we have to improve on them either take them away or add more features make them more meaningful now in case that uh, still doesn't work then we have to um, be more outbound in our marketing and we have to incentivize partners in our channels to uh, promote h 2 and hopefully that uh, allows us to gain uh, a larger initial user base now besides our users and uh, the visitors that come onto the website projects also form a very large part uh, of our existence. So in case that when few projects come onto H2, or open H2, then we have to, the first way we can uh, mitigate this is to approach high schools and colleges and offer to feature their school projects on the site. Um, well, hi, um, you know the schools um, often have their own very uh, side projects, extra curricular activities. So I think um, they'll be a good place to start. Um, they would want to be the projects to be featured on on a, uh, on a website to be brought online. So in case that, that doesn't work, then we will have to rethink the collaborative tools that we have, that we offer on OpenH2. Maybe it's uh, lacking in depth or scope. Um, it's just not uh, cutting it. Um, it. The visitors to our website, or, I mean the projects that come onto the website, do not find the feature set that we, that we offer useful, and um, we have to change that. So. Um, of course, in the scenario that uh, instead of um, experiencing sluggish growth, we can also experience explosive growth. Or well, this is what we want. But uh, in case uh, we do not have enough resources to handle the sudden growth, then uh, first we can engage the community to volunteer pro bono. Um, since we have large numbers, uh, it's it's um, I guess it's reasonable to assume that. There'll be more people who will be who will be willing to uh, volunteer their time and skills. Now, in case that still doesn't um, help us gain uh, enough people to manage the site, then we can start uh, we can push forward our action plan and start to seek uh, individual donors and responses to fund the team. Well, we do. 
these last thoughts or this last quote. Give a person a fish and he will eat for a day. Give a person how to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. Hopefully through this presentation, this <laughs> hopefully through this presentation we provided you not only with the tools, but valuable lessons and strategies to help grow open nature to us. This is where we started as Prote in the present. We wish to get OpenH2O here in the future. And through the DDR framework, recommendations, analysis, we hope that we provided the right fuel to drive OpenH2O across the chasm. Thank you. I hope to see you guys in <laughs> Okay, very good job. Um, I actually have to leave in uh, eight minutes now, so if that's possible, I'd like to ask just a few questions uh, before I go. How is your time, Cesar? Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you for this uh, really good and uh, deep and detailed uh, presentation uh, and uh, where you worked really well as, as a team. Uh, I just have basically uh, one main question I'd like to start with. Uh, when you are presenting this new ecosystem uh, you are suggesting, one, uh, one major part one major player of this new ecosystem is the e equipment providers, so the ocean technology equipment providers. Uh, my understanding is that uh, you would recommend to include all of them and not specifically the open source uh, hardware ocean technologies. So could you comment on that? And basically my question is what do we do about this uh, ocean technology equipment provider who are not open source, who basically do not follow our ideal of sharing the technology and co-developing it? I think that's a good question. We have to think about that there are two different types of oceanic equipment providers. The first kind are the ones that want to open up their technology so that they can develop and then the second kind is exactly the one you just described of the ones that want to remain a little bit closed. But if you think about the purpose of what OpenH2O is going to provide for them is that it's a community. It's an Amazon.com marketplace for them to come up here and identify different buyers. And so they're incentivized to provide their buyers with the right tools and the right equipment. So whether or not they are open source, they still are after the same thing. These two different groups that are identified they still want to be able to sell their products to research institutions, to enthusiasts, to what we might classify as students and technologists. So even though they might not be open source per se, I think it'll still reach the goal and the vision of being able to create a community where they come on board to innovate technology. Mm. <laughs> mm hmm hmm Mm -hmm. Okay. 
my uh, any comments? Also, uh, yes. Do you involve the, the um, manufacturers who are more closed? You also can use them to sponsor contests because a lot of these companies are looking for innovation and they can't find it in house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would also give them access to partner with relevant research institutions and other institutions uh, and help them to be more open. And, all, and it's uh, a way to find the sponsors. It's a way to become more meaningful. It's a way to get them ideas and new technologies and help them find potential future employees. So I think that there's a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. Keep it, uh, you know, open it up to the manufacturer. Okay. Yes. Very good. Uh, my 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 next question before I have to run is, uh, you you just had one slide about the uh, need for clear branding uh, to differentiate uh, Prote and uh, Open H two O, and uh, I think that's a key point that uh, was um, found during the face to face interviews. And so, what other recommendation than just using a, a different, I mean, Prote is the product and OpenH2 is the community. That's uh, correct, but what kind of different uh, communication channels could we use or should we use different message to discuss, to, uh, to get the word out and different buckets of people who would maybe be more interested in the community and some more other people more interested in the product. Uh, and also, if we feature all the products on the web page of the community, then they are uh, also both in the same place. Um, do you see what I mean? We have both Prote and OpenHO in the same place. So how could we elaborate on this idea of uh, clear different segregated brandi branding between OpenHO and Prote? Yep. So to answer your first question of just that one slide on the clear branding, though we only had one slide, we feel the whole presentation was a demonstration of how open H2O should be open H2O as opposed to just Prote. And so yep. we started off with the vision of what the big picture was and where Prote fit within the positioning of open H2O. And so yep. then taking from that, to answer your second question of then what does that mean if there are not only Protes but also other products along the within the web community? What does that mean to the users? And we think that's exactly what the users want to see. So based on the surveys that we've researched, they want to see innovative technology. They want to see products such as Prote. But they also want to see things that aren't just about Prote. It's not just about oil spills. They want to see things that can help them co-design, co-develop. Um, research institutions, oceanic providers want to see other products, other audience reaches on there as well, so that we think the community makes the most sense, so that we can have and we should have different products on there, Prote and others, as they come along within the vision. Yeah, so in terms of communication, you would put the efforts on the community, and then people who are coming to the community will just go to the place they are interested in. I think it could, it doesn't have to be limited to one. It can be a combination of both, right? Mm -hmm. Because people who are interested in Prote will come to Open H2O and see that there's a community there. People who are yeah. interested in the community of Open H2O and what open source is all about will go there and they'll see a product such as Prote. And I think either way, that combination of the two channels will get the right message across. And with the redesign of the website, once they visit it, they'll be able to understand more clearly that Prote is a product, OpenH2 is a community. I can come up here and, and do you know, what the communication of OpenHTO is trying to provide. Yeah. Uh, in addition to a distinct branding, what's important is to develop a distinction and have a clear messaging document and yes. a messaging plan because I think that's where it was confused because it was blended. And to have that distinction, like Alan was saying, messaging document, who you are as a community, 
and then a messaging plan of how, how do you deal with and how do you message the uh, spin-off technologies. Plus the website would need to be designed in such a way that um, it would be a click through, like there'd be the inner uh, development of the technologies, but then Prote would be have its own website, which was the for-profit technology. So uh, that's where the distinctions need to be. Yes. The web, the branding, the messaging, and then how you take that out to your community. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you. And uh, I'm very sorry, but I have to run now. Uh, if I have more questions, I will send it by emails. And uh, and uh, I guess that's it for today. But uh, maybe we could have a, a last quick meeting uh, sometime uh, next week or so to say bye bye officially and see uh, if you are interested to continue the adventure with us. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Okay, cool. All the best. Thank you for today, and uh, see you soon. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Um, see you there, sorry, guys, before I, I'm really going on right now. So, do you mind if I sort of cut out from the q &A and then you can, you can sort of continue? Because I, I pretty much don't have questions. I saw most of what the team's done. And believe me, I'm really happy with this because you started really shaky and, you know, at the end of it, you, you, you pulled together really well. You know, I mean, the four of you, the fact that one of your team members dropped the class halfway and you had lots of, you know, you, you pretty much had a, a, a rough ride on this one. But, you know, I, I don't know, I, I really, yeah, you, you pulled through and you pulled through really well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed, definitely. You know, great job. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so really great job. Sorry, I'm see, see there. Sorry, I just had like a whole sleepless night last night, and I'm really kind of, you know, I'm I'm going nuts right now. So, I'm I'm going to push off, but I, I don't really have any questions for the team. I, we pretty much saw the slides on Monday, so you know, great job, fantastic job, um, and keep up the good work. All right. Can, can I ask you just, uh, when we this? just one question? Yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so to answer your question, um, looking at slide 39, it shows the whole model. So um, we developed this. Uh, we, we are thinking that this will form the minimum set of features that should be that go on OpenH2 to make the website um, attractive to visitors um, who might want to come on, come on board. And um, yep, so um, this basically forms the whole uh, the minimum set of features that we want, and, and there's no um, uh, discrimination like which one should be should we um, uh, go for first. We, we think this should all be on the website when it launches.
if uh, we had to pick um, some features that we want to implement first, then uh, I would recommend that we look at um, what the users want the most. So uh, previously, we explored that they want um, educational resources the most, and they also want to collaborate uh, with uh, each other on their projects. So if I had to pick, then I would say um, uh, one, uh, research findings and uh, columns. The, this is the articles page that, uh, that we feature on the main page of the website. And uh, secondly, uh, we would choose um, forums, definitely, because it um, allows a very uh, easy and uh, intuitive way for uh, users to discuss on topics. And if we have the liberty to choose more, then I would say um, tutorials and DIY. And this allows them to uh, to learn from other uh, um, projects that are already completed, and how they can um, uh, maybe improve their on on these completed projects, and uh, an event calendar so that they can set a, a date and a venue for them to meet and uh, do do cool stuff together. So these are the these are the features that I would put first. So um, we have uh, three different buckets uh, identified. So on page uh, on slide number thirty six, we basically identified how um, these resources that you mentioned can be exchanged between one bucket to another, and how whenever one uh, one bucket provides the other products, uh, the other buckets would basically benefit a lot from from it. So uh, is this what you're looking for? Um, Caesar, if I may and add, you're saying it was kind of conceptual, and you prefer sort of like a more practical approach of how this can actually be implemented. No, I was just saying. So, are you saying that what what you're looking at right now is slightly more conceptual, and you're still not able to translate this into sort of a practical way of how you might be able to implement it? That's right. So Caesar, if I may add, uh, you can create workspaces for different projects, um, um, uh, add functionalities which people are looking for. Uh, for example, if it's uh, just coding a website, uh, what languages they need, uh, what packages they need, and if it's um, uh, developing on robotics, uh, where they can find resources uh, for robot uh, robotic products um, and uh, what they need, what uh, online resources they need. So you can create workspaces individually um, for each different project. And, um, also, just to um, build on top of that, um, the reason why we approach it from a very high level is that because um, of this uh, kind of uh, this project mission that we have is to uh, teach OpenH2 how to fish rather than uh, give OpenH2 the fish. So uh, we don't want to go 
too too detailed um, an explanation because uh, this is just a uh, this is um, an experiment. Yeah, correct. So if we were to go into very detailed, um, once a, fa a factor slightly changes, then uh, the whole point, the whole thing, the whole uh, explanation will be uh, irrelevant. So what we want to provide here is a high level concept um, that uh, we can give you so that in any case, um, you can apply this to many different scenarios and these uh, principles will still apply. And I'll just need the evaluation forms from you by Monday, right? Yeah. So same like last time. Uh, yeah. Just you and Nitian do one form together, and then you can uh, email them over. Yeah. Once you're done. All right. Thanks, Caesar. All right. Take care. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Bye. Great job, guys. Fantastic. Really good. So we have sort of one evaluation form. So yeah. do we want to talk? Um, I think we should only start uh, incubating or um, coming involved is an, in an uh, accelerated program. Only not just when the website is mature, but when the community is, is mature, when we have the numbers and uh, the, uh, maybe a few years of experience on managing the different projects that exist on OpenH2, then we can start to uh, give advice um, to um, a specific project on how they can uh, grow as a as as an entity, so it won't be it won't be too early. Um, for us, we classified under a late stage, um, so because uh, we want to the community to be mature first. Yep, I, I think that's a great concern. And one way to mitigate that would be not necessarily to position it as the marketplace, but more of a community oriented environment where buyers and sellers go. And then from there, you can link it outside of your site so you're not directly related to the buying and selling of the products. Rather, you are just linking up the buyers and sellers and, the, and bringing on enthusiasts as well. And then from there, you are you know, still providing that center, you know, headquarter-like marketplace fashion, but you are not you know, engaging in retail sales. So that could mitigate the problem of uh, you know, losing some of the nonprofit uh, sponsors and attracting this. Um, in addition, um, you could also create a subgroup marketplace um, of ONH2O um, under the umbrella since you're trying to make a prote um, a for profit product, um, not necessarily under, um, so you don't have to create the Amazon marketplace in the name of H ONH2O. So ONH2O remains a non-profit community, but you can have like a, a subgroup of it uh, which is a marketplace. Uh, 
uh, in the name of uh, Prote. Right. Yeah. Uh, in uh, under the umbrella of Open H2, Open H2 will be non-profit. Um, you you have different products, but there's also a um, um, shop, like you said, like an Amazon marketplace, in addition to the other products. Um, I would like to give you an example of Mozilla. Mozilla started out as a non-profit organization, but uh, uh, recently they started only a, a group of it as a for-profit. So you can do something very similar at an advanced stage when um, Open H2 is a bigger community uh, in our mid-term goal and uh, transitioning towards our long-term goal. The whole hybrid, the whole hybrid model of you know, the whole hybrid model of for-profit and non-profit is really taking now. If there's a foundation center in San Francisco, and I know that they are also talking about that. The Stanford Innovation Art, I sent that around, is another example that you know, they're looking at how, what is sustainable as a non-profit. And, you know, pure, pure non-profit is hard to maintain now, especially with the economy and the way the um, sources of income are drying up. So. This is actually good because it allows for a lot more creativity in um, issues. What's that? Uh, no, creativity and how you um, approach a market, whether it's for profit, non profit, or come up with a hybrid. So I think it's a valuable discussion we're having is do we keep uh, Open H2O in pure in a way? I think you might need to to keep the enthusiasts and to keep the, the whole spirit behind it. But that doesn't mean that having some kind of a for-profit arm or a marketplace is, is an adjunct to it. It's just food for thought right now. All right, um, so maybe as a last point, we can uh, give an analogy to this. Um, you can think of OpenH2 as a bazaar. So the bazaar is could be a non for for non profit, but the individual stalls that are inside the bazaar could be for profit, and this would be this would be analogous to the individual projects that reside um, on OpenH2O. Right. Um, Um, so if there's a subgroup which is for profit, it will uh, kind of act like an independent organization with its own hierarchy, uh, but there won't be any hierarchy within uh, Open H2O itself. Open H2O is open for everybody, um, so um, th there is no hierarchy in there, but then the subgroup itself will have a hierarchy and it will um, uh, it can um, uh, act as an independent organization and func function as an independent organization in itself. Right, 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 exactly. Uh, so we could have like a, a COO uh, who could hire people and uh, we can have managers um, and then employees, um, but then everybody will report to, uh, say, Caesar.
I think there's two ways you can think about that. The first way is you can think about it if you want to maintain OpenH2 as an organization. And the second way is if you want to maintain it as a business. So within an organization, you know, call it a, a, a nonprofit organization or a group association, people will volunteer their time. They might not, not necessarily get paid off of income. And so a rotational program, such as an officer role or something that comes up every one or two years that rotates, that's ideal for an organization where people are volunteering. But if it becomes incentivized that people are spending their time and you know, gaining some monetary benefits, for example, as a job, then it makes more sense to think about it in terms of a business, where you want to play someone in a leadership role and you want to identify these governors, these moderators of the online community that share the same vision, share the same goals as you do, and then leave it up to them to either delegate to other people or to monitor um, and govern the site correctly. So a 501c3 is a corporation. It's got federal and state regulations that you have to comply with. And um, generally, we also have a board of directors. And um, so those are nominated, elected, and you'll want to get, you know, hopefully, people of fairly high stature to contribute. But as a nonprofit, you still would be great if you could get some money to hire a very small skeleton staff to maintain the organization or the business part of it because it is a corporation and then set up the community so it's self-moderating and that the leaders who are part of an open source community rise to the surface. Um, and you, I'm sure you would want to set up some guidelines on how to manage the community. Uh, also, other things to think about is uh, with someone submits a paper, does it automatically get there or do you need a review process? But these are some of the policies you'll have to look at or guidelines you'll need to put in place. But um, as a nonprofit corporation, uh, you need to be in compliance. And there's great resources in the Bay Area for nonprofits to learn. Uh, there's, the, a, the, um, there's a whole uh, the office downtown San Francisco that you can go get classes and guidance and databases, it's, it's fantastic resources to get it set up. Um, but firstly, to answer this question, I think we have to bear in mind that um, open um, open H two as a community doesn't um, we aim not to um, generate the bulk of the content. The bulk of the content should be generated by the individual uh, individual projects themselves, and we have an API or um, a system that that uh, fishes out the the more popular ones and uh, feature it on open H two O. So. Um, 
by that I th I think um maybe um maybe the the way that we uh, are approaching this is that we're talking about this is uh we're not on the same same page. Um so for for example if Prote wants to um edit uh edit uh, their page they wouldn't have to go into an edit mode because um OpenH2O has the platform, the project space that allows them to post and uh, to edit articles without having to uh, go on a very low level to edit uh, the HTML uh, or PHP or whatever files that they need. Does it answer your question? But on on the other hand, okay. But on the other hand, if an administrator of OpenH2 wants to edit the fe features of the OpenH2 community, then yes, they'll uh, they'll need uh, to they require a very low level access. Correct. So to draw to draw an um, an uh, analogy. Uh, for example, for example, if you look at uh, Facebook, so there are many, many users on Facebook. Just like uh, there'll be many, many projects on OpenH2. So, for example, if a if a user on Facebook wants to edit their profile, they don't really have to go edit um to type in HTML code, right? They just have to uh, uh click on some buttons. They can add or remove their profile pictures, or uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for a project to um edit the the information that they want to put on OpenH2. It will be a similar feature. They don't. They don't go very low level. But for example, if, if the administrator of Facebook would want to edit the features that you find on Facebook, then um, he will require he will require the skills and maybe um, a specialized program to do that. So I, I'll expect the same uh, same thing for OpenH2. Anyone has a question on Sure, that's a great idea. Um, uh, for now, uh, since uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn are more popular, they have more users. Um, I thought uh, it's a faster way to uh, get word out about uh, Prote and OpenH2O. But uh, the discuss is definitely um, a good website, and we can integrate that with um, our other uh, features as well. And there's uh, Google Plus, and there's Reddit, and then there's Dig.com. So these are some of the other um, social media sites we can definitely explore. Mm -hmm. If you want to discuss, do we talk about? Sorry, can you repeat your question again? Oh, like having shorter comments and more uh, longer comments, like two different sections? Oh, okay. Yes, there. 
Uh -huh. There are definitely a lot of widgets these days. We can integrate all the um, uh, websites, uh, social networking websites, and you know get content from one um, website to another. There are a lot of widgets, and it's very simple to do that. Um, so we can definitely do that when the website comes up, and we can do it through the blog as well. So uh, for example, if we post a comment on Facebook, we can you know, just push the blog, or you know uh, other way around. And if we post something on Twitter, it gets directly pushed onto the website. So we can definitely do that, implement that. It's very simple to do that. Um, there is no specific tool. There are like patches of code that each website gives, like the small buttons. Uh, so you can include the Facebook button or the tweet button right next to the blog or the comment. And you know, if you just press that button, it will go directly to the website. Oh, so they have something connected, but there is a way to put away one line. Like, oh, with that strategy, that would depend on someone typing in and pushing the buttons on the side, is there a way that it will automatically push out and spider out to four or five different, I mean, one comment on a tweet can go populate. Yeah, you can include that in the settings. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For example, um, in LinkedIn there's a setting uh, that you can change, so you can integrate that with Twitter. So when you post something on LinkedIn, it automatically goes on Twitter. So Yes. So each website has a setting, right? Exactly. So each uh, uh, website has a setting, and you've got to just enable that setting. So uh, we're looking basically look at the workspace um, page sixty eight I think um, two slides after all right so um, just to clarify um, you're talking about the, the part that says um, how uh, each task is um, associated with a a creator and and basically everyone can see. Whether that, that person who is assigned the task, or whether he has he or she has completed it, uh, am I right? Well, I'm guessing. Actually, this is a very good point. So maybe this is a feature that we, we do not want to include in the workspace when we launch the website. So um, it's definitely something that we can remove and uh, replace with something else that's something else that's not as uh, divisive. I think. Um, again, so these sort of features, um, they're very specific, uh, very detailed and very specific. Um, definitely, we, we can include them, um, or, and there are many other such features that we can either choose to include or, or not include. But um, the reason why we didn't display it here, although we have uh, definitely considered, considered it, is because uh, we wanted to give um, a very high level over, overview of um, the strategies that we should uh, use to decide whether we should include a particular uh, feature or not. So the examples that you see here, the latest activities, discussion, to-dos, uh, Dropbox, 
these are just an, an example feature set of what may be included you know, in the workspace. I think the next time that you would want to implement a new questionnaire is one when the site is redesigned and two is that from this analysis there's a couple of questions that we can already ask and the one-on-one -on -one interviews are something that you can consistently do or constantly do. Um, that, that is a little bit more time sensitive but those turn out to be very valuable in terms of talking about the surveys specifically. Some of the questions, some of the new questions we would ask would be specifically around the pain points. So directly, you know, why aren't you visiting this site? What is it about this that is not working? So a lot of the survey that we focused on initially was what are you interested in seeing? You as a user, what would get you to the site? What can you contribute? What do you think others can contribute? So we've already figured out that piece of the puzzle. Now we have to figure out the, call, you know, call it the negative side. What is wrong with it? What's what's the bad feedback that we have to face? How do we solve for those problems? So I think now we've identified and consolidated one bucket from three other buckets. So now it's not just now it's not students, technologists, and enthusiasts, rather it's enthusiasts, which include students and technologists. Um, we definitely expand the, the survey to oceanic equipment providers. And I think the way that the survey would work best if it was specific to each of the different buckets, because... Maybe just to uh, start off, uh, when we create a new uh, survey, uh, we, w we want to uh, take in mind that keep in mind that um, the bucketing um, is an actually a, an internal discussion among us to help us uh, develop a strategy. But on the user's point of view, I do, do not think that they will maybe so readily um, identify themselves with. Um, uh, with these buckets, may, even though um, they may associate strongly with it, so on their on their point of view, they are just a, a user, a visitor to this website. So um, on our survey, we shouldn't um, shouldn't force them to say, you know, okay, so we have uh, identified you as an enthusiast. So please fill out this uh, this survey. Um, you, you never know, like from their point of view, they may just be a a, a visitor to this to this website. So even though they dis they they display the the traits of an of an of an enthusiast, um, uh, so basically the point is that um, there's two different points of view that um, this bucketing is an internal point of view, but externally um, we should see them as just visitors to this website. So we should um, survey them accordingly and not bucket them so readily.
Absolutely. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So we'll follow up with uh, some of the ca uh, the passwords and the keys to some of the tools that we use, or all of the tools that we use, so you guys uh, can use them as well. So look for that in upcoming emails. Okay. Firstly, we are extremely grateful that you are willing to wake up so early in the morning to do things with us. So we understand that it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to wake up so early in the morning, so thank you very much for that. And um, secondly, um, well, it depends on like when you want to uh, launch the website. I think the, the plan was to uh, go live by September, is that right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I guess. Uh, well, this is not so, so much of feedback, but a suggestion that uh, if you are looking for uh, web developers, we could um, definitely assist you uh, in that aspect. Uh, if you are looking for people to build the website, uh, we could definitely uh, assist you in that aspect. Because uh, we, uh, we have our own networks, and many of them are uh, really highly skilled engineers and programmers. I don't think there's anything wrong with your thinking. I, I think uh, with all organizations and all people that are passionate about what they do, there's going to be a ton of ideas out there. And with that, you're right, there is a sense of needing to prioritize. And at times, it's hard to determine what that is. So in terms of feedback, then it would be, you know, the way I think about prioritizing something is, realizing what the end goal is. So maybe that end goal is a two to three year time frame, or maybe that's a 10 year time frame. And then you work backward from there to see, will this action, will this step, will this priority get me to where I want to go in two to three years? If so, maybe I can wait it uh, to a certain amount. If it doesn't do anything to help me reach those long-term goals or short-term goals, then let's put it off until the other tasks that will help me reach there can be fulfilled. So taking this, for example, our short-term goals are to be able to launch that website. And so if you know doing things like you know hiring developers or finding content, uh, you know, organizing our thoughts, think about that in terms of a short term strategy should be all the things that we approach. Other things that might not get us there in time, you know, it could even be um, you know collecting more surveys or doing more analysis that might be a lot more time consuming, um, but won't won't necessarily push us forward into building that community and launching the site. Maybe that's something we can hold off of a little bit. So that's just kind of an initial reaction to, to that question. I think we can wrap it up. I think we'd like to uh, take Etienne up on his offer to maybe we could all come on board or all meet up again and uh, formally say our goodbyes and wrap everything up. And 
Maybe if you have more questions or feedback, we can talk about it then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.